Well, good morning, everybody. I think uh, we'll just go ahead and get started, and uh, other agents um, that may join us um, over the course of the next hour, that would be fine. But busy time of the, um, the season, <clears throat> June 17th. Um, um, Ag beat uh, topics today include uh, an update or for the situation on uh, avian influenza. Uh, Dr. Joe Joe Mort, uh, Dr. Raman, our extension uh, plant pathologist, and myself will be talking about uh, brambles and bramble diseases, and also just general disease issues going on um, out in the field. So just to uh, remind everybody, um, you know. Mute your phones, if you have a lot of background noise going on, uh, feel free to, you know, hold your questions until the end of the presentations, which will be 25 to 30 minutes. Um, you're welcome to uh, type in questions that you have over the course of the of the um, presentations, and uh, we can answer those um, at the end of everybody's uh, presentation. But and then, it, you know, after we've discussed these topics uh, enough. Uh, any issues uh, that are happening out in the field, disease, insect, uh, nutrient, crop management, whatever related, uh, we're happy to, um, to try to tackle some of those. So we appreciate everybody taking the time this morning to come and join us. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Joe Mortz, and he will give us um, his update on um, the avian influenza situation. Joe? Okay, good morning. Can you all hear me okay? Are you able to hear hear my voice? I can, this is West Nugent. I can yes. hear you, Joe. Okay, and can Go you ahead, see Joe. the screen okay? Yep. Yes. Okay. Yep. All right, well, good morning. Pleasure to be here. Uh, let me give you my two cents on uh, the current situation uh, uh, concerning avian influenza. Uh, so. I thought I'd just give you a quick introduction of, of a little bit about what I do, uh, talk about the West Virginia poultry industry, uh, give you an update on the H5N2 situation, and then talk about some preventative steps uh, for avian influenza in West Virginia. So I have a three-way split appointment in research, teaching, and extension. And my research is very applied in nature. I do a lot with nutritional consequences of feed manufacture for commercial broilers and turkeys. And that's kind of the predominant area that I'm interested in. But I also do some things with backyard uh, flock producers uh, in, in terms of organic production. And I even do some companion bird research. Uh, my teaching is very much associated with poultry. I teach an applied uh, nutrition class, poultry production class, poultry evaluation class and I do some work in companion animal science. Uh, my extension appointment is the smallest portion of my appointment, but it gives me an opportunity to talk uh, with some small producers and the major integrators in West Virginia, so that's very nice. Uh, and I'm also able to work with uh, some young people in, in 4-H and FFA. So poultry is big business in the United States, of course. Uh, it's a $48.3 billion industry. It's the number one animal protein consumed in the U.S. Uh, the average American consumes about 100 pounds of poultry meat, uh, so it's a pretty incredible number. Uh, poultry is also the number one ag commodity in West Virginia, so big business in West Virginia. Uh, West Virginia contributes $95.3 million, or I'm sorry, million birds rather. Uh, as far as broiler production, and 3.1 million turkeys uh, to the turkey industry. And usually, uh, since the time that I've, I've been at WVU, and that's been about 13 years, we set anywhere from the top 10 to top 18 as far as states contributing to broilers and turkeys. We've got some large integrators in the state, Pilgrim's Pride, Virginia Poultry Growers Co-op, uh, Aviagen, Cargill, and Purdue. And these integrators are very important uh, to supporting our family farm operations uh, for poultry enterprises. So the topic of avian influenza is very important because it uh, not only um, is concerning for the backyard producer or the flock, small flock producer, but for these major integrators that employ uh, several hundred people in the state. So. 
So when you tell people that, that chicken is big business in West Virginia, sometimes they have a hard time understanding uh, where you're coming from because you, know, you can spend a lot of time in the state and you, you don't often run into these large integrated broiler, broiler or turkey houses. So this picture just kind of demonstrates what's going on with one dot being equivalent to 10 farms. And you can see that poultry production in general uh, is very localized across the U.S. So if we look at uh, West Virginia, we can see that we've got uh, some intensive production there in the Potomac Highland area. If we look at a, maybe a hey, Joe. better... Yes, sir. We're still seeing your opening slide. Oh, it's not working at all. No, we're not getting anything but one screen. Okay, we're working there on we it. Go. You got it. Is there it better? better. Yep. yep. Okay. So here we're looking at the map of the U.S. and one dot would be equivalent to two million broilers. And again, you can see how it's really concentrated in the Potomac Highland area. And this isn't unique to West Virginia. It, it's everywhere. You can see in Georgia, northern Georgia, poultry operations are much more concentrated. And that's just because of vertical integration. You've got to have your poultry houses in close proximity to your hatchery, uh, your processing plant, et cetera. So this is just the nature of the poultry industry. So it's number one ag commodity, but it's very much concentrated uh, to the Potomac Island area. If we look at turkeys, we see the same situation. We're here we're looking at one dot equal to 10 farms. And again, the concentrations in the Potomac Island area. Can you, can you see the new slide? Did that transition? Do you see a picture of turkeys? Yes. Okay, good deal. Yes. Okay, so now on to, to avian influenza. And the particular strain that we're concerned about or the subtype is called H5N2. And, uh, you know, for, for a while now we've heard of these different, uh, this different nomenclature used to describe uh, these influenza A viruses. And essentially what we're talking about with the H and the 5, these are two proteins uh, that are on the surface of the virus that allow the virus to enter in uh, and exit the host cell. So the virus is essentially a parasite. And the uh, H stands for hematagglutinin, and the N stands for uh, neuraminidase. And there are 16 different uh, H proteins and 9 different N proteins that have been identified to date. Uh, and the proteins are simply numbered based on when they were discovered. Um, the wild water-dwelling bird carries all different varieties of virus that contain the, the, the different H proteins and N proteins. And typically these birds are symptomless carriers. So they carry the virus, but they're not necessarily infected. The problem comes into play uh, in particular with the H5 and H7 proteins. And these proteins, when, they can be, when they're transferred to domestic poultry, uh, they can mutate. And even the single point mutation where one amino acid changes, uh, they can go from being low pathogenic to high pathogenic. And it's, it's pretty interesting. You can do some genetic sequencing to determine uh, what these, these mutations would look like. Uh, but what the USDA does is they will uh, sample these viruses and then send those viruses to Ames, Iowa, to the National Veterinary Laboratory. And they have a protocol where they inoculate uh, eight germ-free chickens uh, with the particular virus. And over a 10-day period, if six of the eight die, then they consider that a high pathogenic strain. And that's what we're dealing with right now in the U.S., high pathogenic H5N2. Okay, a little history on, on what's happened in the United States uh, in terms of low pathogenic and high pathogenic avian influenza. In 83 and 84, in Pennsylvania and Virginia, we had both low pathogenic H5N2 and high pathogenic H5N2. And this resulted in about 17 million broilers and turkeys being destroyed. In 2002, this was actually the first year I came to WVU, uh, there was an H7 N2 outbreak, this was low pathogenic, uh, and it occurred predominantly in Virginia and North Carolina and one farm in West Virginia. In 2004, in Texas, there was an outbreak of H5N2, and in this situation, it only affected one farm, and uh, around 7,000 broilers had to be destroyed. 
In comparison, today what we're dealing with is a virus that began at the end of 2014 and continues today. I believe the last reported uh, case of H5N2 was actually last Tuesday, and this is affecting uh, about 14 different states. And you can see based on, on the data presented here, we're talking about 48.6 million birds uh, that have been infected. So this is a, a big deal. 41.1 uh, million laying hens and 7.5 million turkeys. Uh, so it's a, it's a very serious situation. Uh, it has huge economic implications. About 15 different countries have banned uh, exports from the U.S. in terms of poultry. Uh, we've seen the price of eggs double, especially for liquid eggs uh, in the Midwest area. And currently, uh, the pork industry is very excited because they feel they're going to sell many more hams during Thanksgiving than turkeys due to the, the drop in turkey production. Uh, so, so big things are happening. Uh, we hope we get a handle on this. Uh, like I said, the last reported case was last Tuesday. That's a good thing, uh, but there's a lot of concern that things are going to pick up, especially uh, if you recall, I said that we're worried about water-dwelling wild birds. And once we have birds migrating south for the winter coming up, we're, we're likely going to see an, an increase uh, in, in the situation. So what do we do about this? Uh, number one, we try to prevent the virus and we try to increase our biosecurity. And biosecurity can be associated with traffic control, keeping people off your farms, you staying off the farms, uh, sanitation, uh, which refers to cleaning and disinfecting uh, anything poultry related, and then of course isolation, keeping any type of infected flock away, uh, depopulating, and, and adequate downtime. The West Virginia Department of Agriculture issued a statement a few weeks ago that live poultry exhibitions, sales, and swap meets have been banned in the state, and I think that was a, a great idea. So this predominantly affects the small producer, right, the small backyard flock producer. And then the West Virginia Poultry Association actually canceled the poultry festival this year. And uh, it, you know, it's interesting to know that the poultry festival has very little to do with getting wild birds, or I'm sorry, uh, your, your poultry together. Instead, it's about people getting together. So we've got to remember that people serve as vectors for this virus. So it's essential that somebody that would have birds uh, that potentially could have the virus and then walk through those barns, they could carry fecal matter on their shoe. Uh, it could then be um, contaminated to another person who would walk into their barns and we'd have all types of problems. So they, they canceled the golf tournament, beauty pageant, etc. And, and again, this has nothing to do with actual birds. It has uh, a lot to do with people getting together. Uh, at West Virginia University, we made a very tough decision to cancel uh, the career development event associated with poultry for the same reason. We didn't want these students getting together uh, that came from backyard flock backgrounds uh, and, and get together with folks that, that had commercial birds at home. And it was just a precautionary measure, and uh, we felt bad about that, but, but I think it was a wise decision. So what can we do in terms of prevention steps, or what can we share with our clientele, especially those that have backyard flocks, because the commercial folks are being taken care of, they're being advised, and, and their biosecurity has certainly been heightened. Uh, but what we can do is, number one, we can look for signs uh, of the issue. Number two, we report sick, sick birds uh, to the Department of Agriculture. And number three, uh, we try to use various strategies to protect our flocks. And I'll just briefly go over these three uh, areas. So number one, looking for signs. Uh, any type of sudden increase in death in flocks uh, would be concerning. Sneezing, gasping for air, coughing, runny nose, watery green diarrhea, these are all uh, warning signs um, and, and you've got to be vigilant. So uh, in these situations, uh, the Department of Ag needs to be contacted. Uh, drop in egg production, that's typically the way that the industry um, becomes uh, up to speed on, on these situations. They'll have a breeder flock, they'll see a drop in egg production, and that'll prompt them to test these birds, and, and oftentimes that's your first indicator. Uh, swelling around the eyes, neck, head, uh, purple discoloration of wattles and combs and legs, that's especially important for avian influenza, and then we can have things like tremors, drooping of wings, uh, twisting of the head and neck, lack of movement, and this is associated with another issue, another virus that's going around right now called exotic Newcastle disease. Uh, so either way, uh, when these conditions are encountered, uh, it's most prudent to then contact uh, the West Virginia Department of Agriculture with their number 
or directly call Dr. Jewel Plumley, uh, the state veterinarian. And based on uh, email correspondence that I've had with Dr. Plumley, this is the most um, time-sensitive manner to get the case reported. So the USDA has a hotline, and you can call them directly, uh, but Dr. Plumley felt it would be better to inform her lab first and let them do initial testing, uh, and, and that would decrease any time lag potential. Okay, finally, uh, how do we protect our flock? Number one, we've got to keep things clean. And we can keep things clean by using detergents, uh, clearing uh, anything of organic matter, and then using some type of disinfectant like a, a sodium hypochlorate, uh, which is the, the primary ingredient in Clorox bleach. And we want to use this on our shoes, on our equipment. Uh, one of the biggest concerns folks have would be egg cartons, um, you know, small flock egg producers uh, that recycle their egg cartons really better for them to use a plastic type carton uh, or, or some type of polystyrene carton that can be cleaned and disinfected prior to reuse. Uh, keep it away is the other concept. You want to restrict access to your property and birds, avoid visiting farms and households with poultry, and uh, you can even just opt to keep your birds indoors. Uh, there was an outbreak in the Netherlands and that was issued to all backyard producers uh, that their birds were to stay indoors. Because again, if they're outdoors, they're going to have most uh, opportunity to come in contact with fecal matter from those wild water dwelling birds. <coughs> we talked about ducks and geese, especially during times of migration, uh, that could, could potentially contaminate a farm. Uh, and if you're going to let your birds outside, they really should be in a situation where they would be covered by solid roofs, uh, and you want to avoid access to surface water. Again, that's going to attract those, those migratory birds, wild water-dwelling birds, uh, which have the, the most opportunity to pass on that low pathogenic strain that can then mutate the high pathogenic strain, affect your own flock, and really have a significant effect on the industry. Okay, that's, that's all I have, and I think we're going to do questions maybe at the end. Is that correct? Yeah. So, okay. All right. Thanks, Joe. I think that, appreciate that. Okay, we'll transition here real quick to um, some bramble um, issues. Well, I'm going to be kind of quick, <clears throat> and um, uh, you know, we just got a, a lot of different crops that we're in production with now, and I thought, it, <clears throat> excuse me, it'd be a timely issue to, to uh, talk a little bit about bramble uh, culture, and then we can transition to diseases and other general disease issues on uh, <clears throat> some of the uh, the vegetable crops. So. Um, Uh, just a few good resources uh, if you have growers that um, need more commercial information on uh, commercial berry production, the um, raspberry and blackberry production guides from Cornell, which is more high tunnel production. Uh, we do have several growers in the state <clears throat> that are growing berries in high tunnels. And then the field production guide, the mid-Atlantic berry guide, is um, of course excellent. <clears throat> So we're seeing a lot of, particularly raspberries, being grown in high tunnels, and it makes sense because uh, growers are averaging about <clears throat> one pint, which is 10 ounces per square foot. So some of the uh, uh, per acre equivalents on the high tunnel uh, berries is as much as 28,000 pounds per acre. So with uh, $5 per pint, this becomes a potentially profitable crop. So variety recommendations for blackberries, <clears throat> I recommend only thornless varieties. And uh, these are Washita, <clears throat> Osage, which are two very good mid-season varieties, and then Triple Crown <clears throat> and Chester, which are uh, late season, also very good. Uh, <clears throat> Triple Crown <clears throat> excuse me, is a relatively soft berry, so it's good for local sales, not, um, not very good shelf life on it, but excellent flavor. It tends to be one of the best tasting blackberries around. Chester's a little tart, um, but it is a good producer and it's hard to, uh, to match it for yield. <clears throat> so uh, for fall fruiting blackberries, which are the primocane blackberries, we do not recommend them for field production in West Virginia. Those are only for high tunnel production because they fly are so late. Um, they, they tend to run out of time to ripen their fruit if they're in the open field, so they need to be put in a high tunnel. Um, they're highly productive but they have some really bad thorns on them, so not easy to, to manage. Uh, most of the fruit, as you see in the picture, is on the outside of the canopy or on the tips of the canes, so it is relatively easy to pick, but um, they are a relatively late season variety and 
cannot be grown other than a high tunnel. <clears throat> On the raspberries, we recommend these varieties. There are dozens of varieties of raspberries. The Caroline, Himbo Top, and Autumn Britain are the three strongest, best producing, vigorous, best tasting red raspberries that we grow here in West Virginia. Uh, you can supplement those with two yellow uh, or peach colored uh, raspberries and, and kiwi gold. Um, the, the black raspberries, which uh, we don't grow a lot of in the state, typically the variety that is dominant is Jewel, but there's a new variety <clears throat> that is called Niwot <clears throat> that is sold by Norse uh, Nursery that is a fall bearing black raspberry. I have not tried it, but uh, if growers are interested in a fall bearing primocane bearing black raspberry, not red raspberry, Niwot might be an interesting variety for some folks. <clears throat> Just a few summer pruning tips. Um, you know that uh, brambles uh, are biennial, so the roots are perennial. They continually send up canes year after year, but the canes themselves go through a two-year cycle on most of the summer bearing types. So as you can see uh, <clears throat> in the picture, this is the primate cane, which is the first year's cane. This cane has to go through uh, cool weather and short uh, <clears throat> days to set fruit buds and then it flowers the following year, fruits, and then dies. And then there is the floricane which is producing the fruit um, the current season. These floricanes, uh, these fruiting canes will die and they need to be removed from the canopy. Uh, at the end of the, uh, of the uh, picking season is good. A lot of the growers will prune the floricanes out at the uh, ground level windrow them uh, in between the, uh, the beds and either uh, uh, take a flail mower over them and, and uh, grind them up. Uh, I think what Dr. Raman would recommend is that all the cane be removed from the field and uh, either composted or burned or, or something out of, the, uh, out of the canopy itself. <clears throat> On black raspberries, they must be tipped and I, I can't emphasize that enough because uh, they are out of control, and if they're not tipped, um, they will increase in width and be unmanageable. So your, your optimal row width for blackberries and raspberries is two feet at most. A lot of growers are a foot in width, but it should be two, no more than two feet. So if you're getting wider than that and you're getting too much shading in the canopy, um, the canopy's not drying out very good after a rain, and you're going to, you're going to see disease issues. So tipping on um, blackberries and raspberries is just removing two to four inches from the tip of the cane. And that stimulates uh, some of this lateral branching. You can see that uh, I've tipped these blackberry canes. This is triple, can triple crown in a high tunnel, one of our high tunnels. And uh, this forces the plant to produce these axillary shoots, which is where all the fruit is on the, uh, the plant not on the tall cane itself, but on the side shoot. So growers need to tip these blackberry canes when they get five feet high, certainly no higher than six. So um, that um, is just by removing the tip of it with a, a, a hand pruner. It'll do the job. Average marketable yields on, on blackberries and raspberries, pretty impressive. Um, three to 10 ounces per square foot or five to 12 ounces per square foot. Uh, for raspberries. So um, this is a highly productive crop. It has high demand. It has high market value. It's very perishable though. So it has to be cooled immediately after it's picked. Um, but we do recommend, you know, that you try it um, uh, possibly within high tunnels if you have a good market. One of the emerging issues, invasive pests, that uh, Dr. Frank will um, probably uh, talk about later in the um, in the season um, at one of these sessions is the spotted wing drosophila, which um, has been a problem in West Virginia for several years, three or four years we've been seeing uh, infestations of this invasive fruit fly. So this is not the average fruit, fruit fly, the vinegar fruit fly, which attacks rotting fruit or overripe fruit. The, um, the fly actually lays eggs in fruit that's just starting to ripen or hasn't ripened at all yet. Um, and then the larvae burrow underneath the skin of the fruit and cause the fruit to completely collapse. Um, usually where the, uh, the uh, female uh, Drosophila lays its eggs, it creates a sunken spot like you see on the strawberry there, 
but uh, nobody wants um, uh, maggots in their fruit. So uh, this is a serious pest, and it's particularly a problem for fall fruiting um, uh, small fruits, like grapes, like fall strawberries, and fall raspberries. It's not been as much of a problem with the fall blackberries as it has been with the fall uh, raspberries. But uh, we would recommend that uh, you do some trapping. You can construct a, um, a um, adult uh, Drosophila uh, trap out of a uh, beverage cup um, filled with two or three inches of uh, apple cider vinegar and uh, suspended above the uh, vinegar is a yellow sticky trap and the uh, holes are drilled in the side of the uh, <clears throat> of the cup, either with a <clears throat> excuse me, with a drill or with a, a hole punch, and allows the um, adults to enter. They get uh, uh, trapped on the uh, sticky card, and then you can identify whether you have uh, Drosophila in the vineyard or in the um, the berry patch. These I usually recommend one trap per acre, and they should be uh, monitored every week. There are some fairly effective sprays for controlling Drosophila, uh, which are in the um, small fruit uh, uh, spray guide. So if anybody in the county offices uh, doesn't have a, um, a 2015 it's a Midwest small fruit and grape spray guide, uh, we are happy to, uh, to send it to your office. But uh, more details on Drosophila trapping um, a little bit later on this uh, summer. I think what Dr. Frank is wanting to do is, is have some of the county agents uh, construct these traps themselves and just kind of report in on whether they're seeing movements of Drosophila <clears throat> throughout, the, uh, throughout the state. <clears throat> so I am going to turn it over now to Dr. Rahman, who will fill in all the gaps that I've left open. Okay, I'll uh, provide a quick update on uh, maize and bramble disease and their management. Basically, three major diseases on leaves and cane, uh, such as anthracnose, spur blight, and cane blight, are the major problems and can cause significant heat loss and, in some cases, plant mortality. So, uh, first disease I'll talk about is anthracnose. Uh, anthracnose is probably the commonest disease on both on leaves, fruits, and stems of very clusters, which is also known as peduncle and, and pedicle. Uh, on stem, like any other anthracnose diseases, uh, lesions appear as small purple spots, and over time, as you can see at the right hand side, over time the spurs enlarge and then become lance shaped uh, with sunken center. So with, like any other anthracnose diseases, it's very easy to identify this uh, anthracnose disease on brambles by looking at the sunken lesions. Uh, this, as I mentioned earlier, this disease can also appear on leaves, uh, especially on leaves. Uh, those lesions, you will see the gray centers, the tan kind of centers, uh, surrounded by reddish margins around the centers. Uh, in, in most cases, uh, fungicide application is not required for uh, managing this disease uh, if the disease, unless the disease pressure is too high. Uh, in, in, in most cases, removal of all diseased canes at the end of the season. I'll talk about some more uh, other diseases that how actually early removal of the canes can help controlling some of those diseases. Uh, and also late dormant application of lime sulfur. Probably many of us try to use lime sulfur controlling many of the diseases on brambles, but in this case, uh, probably two applications can be made. One is early and another is kind of late dormant application. The next disease is far blight, also very, very common caused by DDMLI planeta. Uh, in this case, you will see the disease will appear at the apex or the tip of the leaf and then it will progress like a V-shaped inward. It goes through the uh, petiole and then goes on the nodal zone uh, of the stem or cane. As you can see at the left hand side, uh, this disease actually went on the node and then 
penetrated uh, both sides of the nerves and killing that area and uh, causing the black more slender lesion on the cane. So for, the, for controlling this disease, we really sometimes need uh, some chemical applications. Uh, Toxin M and Nova are really, really well, does an excellent job in controlling this disease, as well as some resistant varieties are available for controlling uh, disease in some areas where uh, it's a recurrent problem. So with Toxin M and uh, Nova or Raleigh, we really need to be very careful because both uh, products are prone to resistance development uh, by the fungal organism DDMLA planeta. So uh, one application of Captain is recommended in the middle of application of these either of either of these products. Uh, leptospheria cane blight or lept caused by leptospheria coniotherium is most uh, important disease in our area. So the, you can see uh, uh, the, on the cane, these are also blighting the cane. So the difference between spur blight and uh, leptospheria cane blight is that spur blight all it starts on the leaves and then it goes on the nodes, but but the leptospheria cane blight or what we call the major cane blight can start anywhere in the internodal area on the cane. And and what my observation is in most cases the infection actually starts from the wounded or injured cane. Here you can see at the left hand side this uh, cane has been injured most likely due to the frost and infection always starts on the on the wounded areas and then it kills the whole cane. If the if that cane uh, infected areas are killed, the top part of the cane can be killed uh, very, very quickly. Here on Triple Crown you can see uh, near Morgantown, uh, I, I had a study how to control this cane blight. You can see the extensive blighting on triple crown, and in most cases, what I have seen is uh, lower uh, areas or bases of the canes are most mostly affected. So, uh, because more, uh, the infection is there most likely due to the wounding or uh, most times this area remains kind of wet and humid because of the weed and so weeding and then you know removal of blighted cane should always play a good role. Here you can see some of those canes in from infected areas and above the whole cane is dead. So I conducted an experiment in 2012 and 2013 with uh, recommended fungicides. The recommended fungicides are Captain, Cabrio, and Christine. So this that study was conducted in a split plot of factorial experimental design uh, with uh, factors, fungicides, and removal and non-removal of blighted cane. Here you can see some of those canes we removed uh, early in the season. That means we did not really wait to, at, the, at the end of the season to remove these canes. So we removed these canes and then applied uh, different fungicides. What we found in 2012 study that early removal of canes reduced cane blight, but the fungicides we used, Captain, Cabrio, and Christine, did not provide adequate disease control, so I further try to explore why it did not control the disease. So we, we tested in vitro some of the products we, I included. Once again, Cabrio and Christine is supposed to do a good job, so I included those two products. In addition, Inspire XT, Quadrestop, Quilt XL, and Proline. So, at the left hand side in the y axis you can see the control compared to the uh, non treated or no fungicide in the medium 100% uh, at the beginning of the 
experiment, but you can see at the uh, this kind of bluish line at the left hand side is Inspire XT that was most effective, followed by Quilt XL Quadrestop in the yellow line, but Christine and Cavio did not provide any control on any suppression of that fungus in control environment. So I took those most effective products to the field Inspire XT Quadrestop and Quilt XL and then uh, defeated that experiment. Here you can see from 2013 results, Inspire XT in combination with removal of uh, cane provided most effective and significant control of cane blight, followed by Quilt XL and Quadrestop. But Inspire XT is not labeled for controlling this disease, so the recommendation here is Quilt XL. Few other diseases like, of course, you can always see the many different types of rust uh, on, on, the, on brambles, uh, but orange rust is caused by two different fungal organisms, is a systemic rust, and the early in the season infected leaves will, will show some kind of distortion and wrinkly, and those plants will not produce any uh, good berries and blister-like, very bright orange color uh, blisters will appear at the lower side of the leaves. So for management of this disease, especially as I said, it's systemic, it goes in, in the whole plant and then it goes inside the root. So removal of the plant is the number one uh, option for controlling this disease and also it the growers need to be very careful when they are propagating. It needs to be propagated only from healthy cuttings. And uh, like other rust diseases, they always be on the wild uh, brambles. So wild brambles from the perimeter of the garden of the field should be removed. On the sites are not that effective, but rally and pristine sometimes helps in the in preventing them spread of the disease. And the last disease I'll be talking about is gray mulberry common once again. If you have crowded or too much berries or, you know, uh, the leaves are very crowded in, in the areas in, in case of rainy and humid weather, it's very common cause by botrytis scenario. So any uh, measures are taken to facilitate air movement will help in reducing the infection as well as very good from the sites available, such as rubral, switch, elevate, and pristine. Out of these four products, switch and elevate really does a good job if applied during the flowering and followed two to three applications uh, after that. So with that, um, probably we'll um, take questions. We have 11, 12 minutes. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Mafuz. Appreciate that. Uh, I do also want to thank Becky Osborne for providing great technical assistance here this morning. We could not have done this uh, from scratch <laughs> without Becky. We appreciate that, and uh, we, we can't. Uh, we just kind of fill in, and um, they do all the hard work. But we're going to open up the uh, uh, limited time we have now until uh, 11 uh, for any questions about uh, any of the topics we discussed. Um, and then beyond that, any questions related to um, to crops or uh, disease or uh, crop uh, growth issues or management issues you might have. So, um, any questions from anyone? What was that fall fruiting variety of blackberries for high tunnels? Yeah, there's a, a variety called Primark 45, uh, which is a good variety. It's a great tasting uh, blackberry. It's got 12% sugar, uh, very firm, good shelf life. Um, the key thing, you know, Brian, uh, uh, to those fall fruiting blackberries is when they get three feet high, you've got to tip them. Uh, that'll force them to produce those uh, side shoots, but um, that'll also force them to fruit a little earlier. Um, but uh, Primark 45 is, um, is, um, is the best. When's the best time to plant those? 
Uh, well, I mean, most of these primocane blackberries and raspberries can be planted, uh, you know, spring, summer, even some growers have planted them in the fall. It's just the getting nursery stock um, a little later than June is, is kind of difficult, but um, if they can find some bare root um, uh, plants and uh, uh, Norse uh, farms, nurseries may still have them in cold storage, uh, they could plant them through the summer. Uh, they wouldn't get any crop. I, I don't think they'd get much of a yield this year if they planted from now onward, but uh, certainly if they planted next uh, spring or if they did plant this year, they'd get a, a, a crop next year. Any uh, questions uh, for Joe about uh, avian influenza and issues related to that, uh, or Dr. Rahman related uh, to uh, any pest or any, uh, disease issues? Uh, hey, uh, Joe, you go do any uh, preliminary swab tests and just randomly around the communities to see if we see anything? Just preliminary swab tests? Yeah, do any NEAI swab testing? I, I, I've not done any of that myself. I mean, that, that would come from uh, Dr. Plumley's office. So I, I guess she reported, and then she discerns whether or not, um, you know, the, the initial testing has to take place. Because I know in the past we have done preliminary with her, but I didn't whether they were even going to consider that. No, nothing to my knowledge that, that we uh, that we implement that. I mean, her her thought was as soon as you have a suspicion, uh, the idea would be to contact her office. Okay. And and you know, there's some things you walk through. For example, we had somebody uh, send an email out the other day, and they said, well, you know, the egg production dropped. And uh, you know, as a nutritionist, my first thought is, did you do anything different with your diet? Because well, you you pull around the calcium level or the phosphorus or sodium level. And you can see an immediate drop in egg production. And you know, sometimes I think it's important to ask some obvious questions first before you jump to conclusions and say, "Boy, this could be a, a potential outbreak." But again, uh, you know, Dr. Plumley wants to make those calls. All right. <clears throat> so, I do. Can uh, I bring it back up? No. I I I just wanted to update a little bit on. Um, Tomato diseases. Um, last few days, as you know, it has been rainy and humid. Uh, almost every day, we have been having some rain in this area. I think uh, that's true for most of the uh, state. And I have been having lots of cushions and samples on early blight and septoria leaf spot. Uh, here I have one uh, tomato plant actually is almost killed by septo uh, early blight. So. Uh, I think this is the time actually to go ahead and then take some measures either to apply copper hydroxide like sulfide uh, or chlorothalonil, bravo, uh, because next few days also, as the forecast is saying, it will it will stay cloudy or rainy, and uh, so some measures will be necessary to protect those plants, especially in combination with uh, removing some lower leaves and some protective uh, fungicide. Uh, organic growers can also use uh, copper hydroxide. So this is probably a good time to initiate the application regardless of the age of the plant. Uh, just one question I have for you, Mathuz. I mean, it's, it's one of the growers was saying uh, to me recently that they were rotating uh, liquid copper, copper, uh, hydroxide with uh, mancozeb and we're getting very good blight control. Would that be a good uh, rotation instead of just using chlorothalonil or daconil or funganil, maybe alternating the copper with a, a mancozeb or something? Uh, uh, I think that's, that's true for uh, late blight, but uh, from my experiment last year, what I have seen, uh, mancozeb is, is effective against late blight, uh, white ulcer infestants, but not as effective for septoria and uh, alternaria leaf blight. So, but uh, it, it, it provides some uh, some protection. In com uh, so it, it can be used in combination because this 
uh, weather condition is also very, very conducive to late blight. And uh, from the forecast, uh, we are not seeing any disease coming to our way yet, but uh, it's very uh, possible that uh, it can be here at any time. So some preventative measures uh, with uh, combination of clozothalonil or copper and menthazep will definitely be helpful. Yeah, it seems like we're in this pattern of continual rainfall. Like we're kind of yeah, we had like a um, couple of weeks, very good, um, you know, dry weather, but now it's <coughs> and uh, this this is very conducive to all foliar diseases and tomatoes and potatoes for, for sure. Okay, great. Anything out um, in the, um, the counties that uh, we should be aware of, or you see any any trends and any any pests or anything like that? I'm seeing some questions about flea beetles cropping up. Um, I think they seem to overwinter okay, and they're you know doing their their usual thing. Uh, we can probably talk a little bit more about them with Dr. Frank in the next uh, next session. But is there anything? In the counties uh, that you all have, that we should uh, we should be uh, aware of. Well, the the poplar trees getting a lot of calls. They they think they're dying, and I, I'm Daniel sent out a uh, email about that. Yeah, it's 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 all over. I mean, um, but uh, probably in general, it should not be too concerning. But all those uh, beetles are flying and. We will uh, we will be flying uh, on the car and on the mm. outdoors and that's their only host. I mean, is that the? Uh, I mean, no, magnolia and sassafras. Those are also hosts, but we are seeing mostly on uh, tulip poplars. Uh, it happened a few years ago. Like uh, we had uh, very high infestation. Uh, some scale, and uh, you know it caused lots of concerns because of these honeydews and sooty mold growing on uh, yeah. on driveways, and so that did that even did not require any kind of real insecticide application. The only thing is, they're saying they're not seeing the the. The, the black excretions before. Is this a different creature? No, it, 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 it can, it actually, the cycle is like uh, every four or five years, but uh, it, it really, I, I, what I, I, I feel like probably the infestation level was not as high as this year. So it, nobody really noticed it, but it, it, it can come every few years. Uh, this atlas seems very high. Yeah, time coming. See here. Um, and also, I uh, prepared a uh, press release of uh, some news article on uh, on the cypress uh, mortality and uh, you know winter injury and those kind of things. It will be available to the counties probably by the end of the week. Actually, most, many, there are many evergreens uh, affected by that uh, winter desiccation followed by uh, ceridium canker. So it's a combination of other events and other stresses. So that news article should be uh, in the counties uh, in a day or two. And I think that will uh, answer many questions. Okay, uh, you know, just a reminder that we will archive all these presentations, and you'll be able to access them later to look at, you know, them in a little bit more detail. Uh, if there aren't any further questions, uh, we do appreciate everybody taking the time in this busy season to to uh, join us for some uh, crop updates. Uh, so join us in two weeks, and we'll have another session related to either insect diseases or crop management. Uh, thanks a lot, guys.